Hello, I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond and one of those memos pertains to English. Specifically varieties of English that are spoken by American humans and children. Ever since my first poorly lit video, I've made several more in defence of American English. And that's because, as I said in this video, the story of American English, much like the story of language in general, is highly compelling. Is highly compelling. But it's also completely and utterly a little bit bonkers. How do I know? Because I've heard, read and sometimes spoken it while living in the United States for the past 16 years. Whether we're talking about words that have the same meaning meaning or regional variations that are completely unknown in other parts of the country, American English, like British English, is packed with quirks. And if you like quirky things and haven't subscribed to this channel, do that now! In the meantime, let's take a look at how American English is one bizarre variety of English. In case you've only just woken up, that transition slide did not say cinnamon rolls. We just couldn't think of a better pun for the word synonym. What's a synonym, Lawrence? Good question, Lawrence. A synonym is a word or phrase that has the same meaning as another word or phrase. For example, remember three weeks ago when I said this? Cougars, pumas, mountain lions, catamounts and panthers. I'm being told those are different words for the exact same animal. Well, just like how the British have 348 words for drunk, the United States has a significant number of synonyms synonyms of its own, many of which are dependent upon where in the country you are. For instance, in the north, these curious crustaceans often go by the name of crayfish. However, in the deep south, where they are most commonly harvested, they are known as crawfish. But try telling that to people in the middle or in the west who might know them as crawdads. Freud would have had a field day with those people. He'd also have a field day with people who seek out my address. Ever since last year when I bought my first American house, I've received all kinds of weird things in the mail, and at no point did I make my address public. So how did people get a hold of it? Don't worry about that. Well, it turns out that data brokers had collected personal data about me and my house and sold it to various property listing websites. And when I say various, I mean 124. As you can imagine, nobody has time to ask that many websites to remove their personal data because it would literally take weeks. So thank goodness for our partner today, Incogni. Incogni is a personal data removal tool that contacts those data brokers on your behalf. In fact, just 10 minutes after launching my first batch of removal requests, roughly one third of data brokers confirmed my data had been removed. If your personal details are showing up on people search websites, Incogni can help you remove them. In fact, they're giving my subscribers 60% off their annual plan. Head to incogni.com slash lost in the pond to get your discount and to thereafter protect your data. The link is in my description below. During that deeply beautiful brand integration, Max just told me that his family knew crawfish as mud bugs, which makes me think of wood lice. What are wood lice? It's what we Americans call roly polies. A actually, they're called potato bugs. I don't even have a name for that thing. Along the Ohio River, my family called them pill bugs. Dude. These are doodle bugs. Lawrence is lying. In England, we actually call them cheesy bugs. That's regional. In Devon, we call them chiggy pigs. It's Parsons pigs. Okay, clearly British English is the bonkers one. The point is, as a country with an area of 3.8 million square miles, you could say that the US might be even more prone to inter-regional synonyms than Britain. Then again, I remember when I first moved from my English hometown of Grimsby. No one at university knew what the word Mardi meant, and Mardi just means you're in a bad mood. Yes, and what I need you to do right now is to pay close attention to the previous transition slide. Are you serious? It almost looks like text speak, except in that case my team would have written it like this. Instead, only the word R is textified because it is the letter R that I want you to pay close attention to. You see, one of the defining linguistic traits shared by most, though not all, Americans is the post-vocalic R in words like, well, Mardi. Aside from the fact that it sounds like the name Marty in American English, Rotic speakers in the US would more or less pronounce this regionally English word as Mardi. However, since moving to the United States, I've detected one or two exceptions to this rule. Number one, there are still small pockets of the US that remain non-rotic, like most of England. Number two, as I've mentioned before, there are rare instances in which Americans will incorporate a post-vocalic R in words that don't have one, like Colonel. Colonel. And C. Three. And number three, there are peculiar instances of words that do have them, but for which the R is often unpronounced. Take, for example, the word forward. While most Americans 
pronounce it? Forward. A phenomenon has emerged in recent decades in which some Americans drop the first R. In linguistic circles, this phenomenon is known as dissimilation. That's when speakers drop a vowel or consonant if it appears later within the same word. And it owes much to the principle of horror equi, which proposes that language users psychologically avoid repetition of identical linguistic structures. That's why some Americans might also dissimilate the first R in words like governor, berserk, and particular. Moving forward, the governor in particular will go completely berserk. Larry. Yeah, it's a free kick. While consecutive instances of the letter Z have inexplicably come to denote the sound of snoring, they also show up with surprising frequency in words that were coined in the United States. Perhaps the most famous is jazz, a world-renowned form of music that emerged out of the African-American communities of New Orleans from the late 19th century. It is widely believed that the word jazz evolved out of jasm, which meant vitality or energy and not what you're thinking about, you little. In fact, it went through several definitions before lending itself to an entire genre of music, something that first occurred right here in Chicago in 1915. And the jazz age that followed spawned several Zed heavy words like snazzy, pizzazz, twizzlers, and future astronaut Buzz Aldrin. So it was perhaps little wonder that one of the nation's favorite meals became so popular at about that time. Pizza. In fact, you kind of have to wonder if it would have had the staying power in the United States if the Italians had named it something without Zs, like bread pie. That certainly wouldn't have led to America also giving us the word pizzeria from 1928. And I know what you're thinking, ooh, Lawrence, Z heavy words were just one of many fads of the jazz age. One era doesn't a data set make. Then know this, more than 20 years before jazz entered the lexicon, American English also gave us razzle dazzle, razzmatazz, and almost certainly blizzard. They have 10 Zs between them. And in the years since, American English has rolled out buzz cut, ZZ top, and most recently Riz, a slang form of the word charismatic, which today is appropriately popular with Gen Z. So what does all of this tell us? It could tell us that Americans are guided by their senses. Many of the words that I listed are partly or fully onomatopoeic. What does onomatopoeic mean, Lawrence? Onomatopoeic words are words that sound like the thing they are describing, whether it is the buzz of a razor or the sizzle of pepperoni. Either that or the American Scrabble Union just really wanted to raise the stakes. That said, there's at least one such word for which the United States can't take credit, and that word is drizzle, which emerged in England many centuries ago and hasn't stopped emerging since. As evidenced by the word forward, Americans can't always agree on how a word should be delivered. And this is by no means unique to America. In Britain, we're still fighting wars over how to say this. It's a scum. It's a scone. But sometimes American English takes things a step further. Sometimes a word is delivered differently because subtly it is a different word. There are members of my wife's family alone who describe their favorite vices as addictive and others who say addicting, a word I'd not heard until moving to the United United States. Similarly, familial lines are also drawn on whether one does something by accident or on accident. Here you go. So sorry, 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 that was, that was, that, that was on purpose, actually. Americans are often ridiculed for saying, I could care less, because I could care less implies that they care a lot. In other words, so goes the logic, I couldn't care less would be more, well, logical. But from what I've seen, half of the people doing the ridiculing are Americans themselves. You see, the real divide in this country is not between right and left, it is between those who could care less and those who couldn't, a bit like me on this issue. The truth is, English is itself quirky, whether we're talking about British English, English of the United States, or that of other countries that Britain invaded. Without this quirkiness, the English language probably wouldn't be half as interesting, and I'd be stuck making videos about just animals. Actually, on that note, I have to run now because a certain doggy of mine is being prepped for a starring role in my next video. Bye! Larry, that was a little abrupt. Well, I mean, data shows that viewers click away during those meandering goodbyes, so I figured we'd get around it by not letting them. Okay, but you didn't tell them to continue binging by watching the Why American English is Highly Misunderstood video. Max, if our audience is as smart as you think they are, then they'll figure it out. You better be right. I'm always sometimes right.